I'm a longtime admirer of Merrill's work, and I had the pleasure of writing the introduction to Merrill's latest book, the catalog for this exhibition. It looks like this. Be sure to get your own copy. Beautiful book. And I'd like to begin by reading a passage from my introduction, which I hope will set the stage for our discussion. Board to city, drop dead, went the headline of the New York Daily News, to which the city said to Ford, you first. When the Daily News ran that famous headline on October 29, 1975, New York was teetering on bankruptcy. President Gerald Ford had declared he would veto any federal bailout. It looked like the Big Apple was stewed. The world had written off New York, but the feeling was mutual. The city had written off the world. Between 1970 and 1980, the city lost nearly a million residents, over a tenth of its population. Still, New York attracted people who, against the reigning wisdom, would not or could not live anywhere else. In 1975, some 100,000 new New Yorkers were born within the city limits. I was one of them. And in the same year, Merrill left the middle class comforts of North Massapequa, Long Island, and moved to the city to focus her lens on the lives of New York. The worlds of that New York were smaller, more contained, more vivid than today's sprawling city. Now, as we contend with renewed challenges, the 1970s, as it turns out, have much to teach the 2020s. Back then, if the town was really going under, those who remained to live through the decay were determined to dance among the ruins. Camera in hand, Merrill captured the demimon dancing on the city's grave and then said, but she looked for the life and the humor of the city's streets. She did not indulge in the spectacle of wreckage she set out to document its many humanizing moments. Compassion radiates from her viewfinder and lights up her subjects. In a flash, the faces of the city of Mayu come alive in her images. In the early 1980s, Merrill turned from downtown to the outer boroughs as she became the original Bushwick beatnik. She brought her camera to the classroom when she took up her job in 1981 as an arts teacher at Bushwick's IS-291 where you also taught. I was to come later. Oh, you taught later, okay. The Bronx, the Bronx was burning, and blocks at a time of this North Brooklyn neighborhood had burned too, leaving families to live among the ruins. Merrill set out to tell their side of the story. She never stopped taking pictures, even as her teaching life took over. Thousands of images came to rest on her negative slides and eventually digital chips. Only after her retirement, few years ago did she begin to develop this archive into exhibitions and books. Through images that have not been seen for 40 years, Merrill juxtaposes the worlds of Bushwick and Bohemia following the highs and lows of a city in decadence and decline through day and night. Her dance club shots taken on a medium format camera are electric, dazzling, flash-filled black and white. These, record, these records of a club culture gone by contrast with her Bushwick scenes, which she took with a point and shoot camera and developed as full color slides. One consequence of the destruction of Bushwick was the opening up of the neighborhood to the sun. Bushwick, unlike the shadowy canyons and caverns of Manhattan, radiates a ruinous light. As in a city after a bombing raid, the residents of 1980s Bushwick stumbled through the debris. Yet, despite all the outward appearances of junk cars and the rubble strewn streets, life goes on. Kids play among the burned over remains or wait for the school bus by a line of wrecked cars. A toddler dresses up for Halloween, an old lady picks her way across a destroyed lot. Ladies dress up for church. Families picnic next to an abandoned car while the children make toys out of the wreckage. The day redeems the night. Now turning to our discussion. Meryl, you were born in the South Bronx and raised in North Massapequa. What brought you to the city in 1975? Well, I was always intrigued by the city, having been grown up in Long Island. Um, I was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, finishing my master's, and my 
my photographs I was taking were of Long Island. And I had a, I had a cousin who, who had family had a brownstone up here and there was a room available. I also wanted to study with Lizette Odell as she was teaching at the new school, Parsons. So I brought my portfolio of photographs that I had done when I was in graduate school. I wasn't a photography major, it was my minor. And I went for an interview, showed the portfolio. She loved the work, went crazy. Picked, she picked one up and said, you should show this work to John Strozowski. And I was too shy. I was always waiting to have more. But I didn't, so I took a class with her. I moved into the sublet, and then I—that was it. It was love. It was love as as soon as I really settled in. It, I fell in love with New York City, and I haven't grown out of it. I never will. I think we all feel that same way. That's great, right? Senator Dwayne. You were born in Chelsea and raised in Queens. In 1976, you returned to this neighborhood. Yes. And have lived here since, representing us in city and state government. <laughs> From 1982 to 2012, do I have that right? Uh, 82, uh, <clears throat> a leader of the Democratic Party. I was the party leader for this area, uh, elected in 1991 to the council. Got it, right. Can you all speak a little louder? Sure. Uh, I was originally a Democratic district leader, which means I was head of the Democratic Party in this neighborhood. And then I, in 1991, I ran for the city council and I won. Openly gay, HIV positive, Magic Johnson was thrown out of basketball, if you recall, in 1991. But people, well, you weren't here yet, but you were here, voted for me anyway. So I represent wonderful people. Even though later on they sent me to Albany, there's still a lot of love that I have for you. I live on Charles Street. And I feel like you were a fixture of Channel 11 news whenever I turn it on, I see you. I was not shy. <laughs> <laughs> You're still not. <laughs> oh. How do Merrill's photographs reflect the city you remember from the 70s and 80s? Uh, um, she captures it. Uh, and uh, the thing about Merrill's photographs is, first of all, the, the people all have um, this like, lovely dignity to them. Um, and the buildings, even if there's rubble, there's always a building standing. And so it makes that building majestic and wonderful and uh, um, and uh, worth preserving. And uh, I'm glad that you've documented them uh, because a lot's been filled in. But a lot of those buildings, people went back into and fixed them up and they lived there. So good job. It's an Thank important, you, it's an important record. Yeah, yes, yeah. Right, if anything else. Who knew? I mean, it wasn't all Studio 54 that she was shooting, you know right. what I mean? It was uh, the real deal. Thank you. Some Studio 54-ish. You know, Meryl, I just say I'm not only amazed by the access you found in the clubs and the classrooms, but even more so by the openness you captured across the communities that you photographed. Thank you. What was it like rediscovering this work from 40 years ago and printing it in many cases for the first time? Well, it was it was like seeing it for the first time. Of course, most of it I never looked at at all. And then when I was, and it's a long story about how that came about. And then I would like I say started first with the Bushwick pictures, and I was picking them up to light, and I could say, okay, it's painted with little point and shoot, and they're fuzzy, and there's plastic lens and the sign, some of them were against the wall in the basement, and they even had like dust and mold, but I realized they were beautiful. And I just, that they were, they were life, and they were joyful, and, and much more than I expected. And so I continue to dig and dig and dig and become obsessed with them. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this show and this book is really, uh, I taught in Bushwick for 13 years, and then came back in 2001 when I said, say, met you and with the Bushwick scene. But it really taken me another 13 years to look through those boxes. And I think I found them all. I probably found another one. And, and understanding that this is not just, it's, it's art, it's life, it's a document, it's important, and it deserves to be seen. Well, I don't think everyone understands that these photos, the black and whites, you printed from these old negatives, right? 
Thanks to James yeah, Pinero, yeah. how he got me into this. Well, yes, we. Well, I actually have a very special. I'd like to interject. There's, there's, the, there's a reason why these two people are here. Tom Twain is not just my state representative. I did live at Chelsea in the 80s as well, but we taught together. He was a visiting volunteer. And uncertified. A, a uncertified not teacher. Um, at the school in my career, in my 31 year career as a school teacher. I spent those 13 years in Bushwick and then I went on sabbatical. When I came, I, I came, moved, started a, a small progressive school here in Manhattan. And all of a sudden it was going to be a guest, a guest, who, a volunteer who wanted to teach about health and sex and politics. And his name was Tom Dwayne, he happened to be a state senator, but he's not a certified teacher. So it's illegal to be alone with the children. So I was his, <laughs> I kept him at bay. And he taught the kids. Civics, guts. civics, the way it really is. As you say, yeah, the way it is. It was well, government according to Tom Duane, but they love the war stories. But I'm also, uh, because there is no civics taught anymore, which to me is just, outrageous and incredible and terrible for the future. I mean, they're kids that don't believe in democracy now, but I just wanted them to know how important government is and what a role it plays in their lives, their entire lives, from health to housing, to what was happening right on in their school, in their classrooms. And uh, I'd like, and I, I love these kids and I think they love me too. I mean, they, years. They, they, like at least a decade. I mean, it was my, it was every Friday, because I knew I wasn't going to be in Albany. I, I loved it. I wanted to be a teacher. But in the mid 70s, the city was having a fiscal crisis. They were laying cops, firefighters, teachers off. So there was no hiring me to be a teacher. So my life took a different direction. But I have been able to come from full circle and I, and I got to teach. So. And he also convinced my, my life partner and I, Patricia O'Brien, to move to where we do. We live in the same community. So we're neighbors as well. We live in a worker's paradise. And he always makes me laugh. Yeah. And James Pinero, once I started digging through this work and wanting to show, not just show it anywhere, but wanting to show it in Bushwick, I was invited to an event at 56 Bogart Building in, in Bushwick. There was a meeting because it was everyone of the Bushwick Arts community kind of scared about what's coming in. like a real gallery is coming in and, and what's going to happen to us and this man was doing a panel like this with artists and a, a writer and afterwards i said hello to him introduced myself and he said i know you but i know your work which is really was a shock and and ever since then we've had this a critic can also be an encourager and that's what james panero is and he felt like for those who know, before anyone did, and for the longest time, he has covered the, the Bushwick art scene as it, it's grown and come together. And then in 2016, the year of the set, after Sassy 70s, James received an invitation to create a show at a place called the Staffs Projects during Bushwick Open Studios. And he calls me and he says, I'd like to meet with you of a lunch and he had this great idea. Why don't you explain the great idea? Uh, well, I, again, to, inspired by your work uh, from the 70s and 80s, I said, we need to create an archive of the 2010s, right? And so I said, let's have an open call for Bushwick artists, anyone who identifies as Bushwick artists to come by and be photographed for the, the record, the Merrill Meister record. And so we created and, that. And, and but like the irascibles of the 50s. Yes, like the irascible portrait. And, uh, and we created an exhibition out of this project. Yes, we created an institution, but James said over lunch, is, <laughs> what, you know, what do you think about getting out your, your, your old film camera and doing it that way again and photographing them like they did in the 50s with the irascibles and I'm like, gee, that, and I'm saying, that's going to be fascinating. I haven't been in a dark room since, you know, since I, Sort of teaching. <laughs> yes. so this is something a critic can, and we can, I can propose it because I'm not the one who then has to do the printing. Yes, yes. I can just, hey, why don't you do it? I said, great. And so I was like, that's a great idea. And I 
you know, why not? And I, I approached, I'm one of those people have double lives. I have a double life up in the city and up in Woodstock. And I was at a barbecue with somebody who worked at Center Photography at Woodstock and mentioned, I really would like to have this idea about going back and doing a project with film photography, but I haven't been in the dark really. So serious work in the dark room since the early eighties. And he says, come to Center Photography Woodstock. You know, we have a, you, this lab you can rent. I said, I don't know what I'm doing. He said, I'll give, I'll teach you. And he did it. And we, so we did it. We, we had a set up a studio in, in, on, in this gallery and people came and we got Wait, them. But they were clothes, pins and, and chemicals? No, no, no. We, we got them to pose. We closed <laughs> pins and chemicals in later. And, and I developed, developed the film and printed it. And it's like, this was fun. This was a challenge. And so you got me. Not just that show, they weren't good enough that I could eight by 10. So then what I do naturally, I'm a teacher. I enroll in beginning photography class again at, at, at our school across the street, FIT, Fashion Institute of Technology. And I had to flunk the class so I could take it again and again and again until finally they said, we just can't keep doing, we love you, but we can't keep doing this. And I would go on, on sabbaticals. I'm not so bad. I'm a teacher always. I go on. A, I went to residencies, which right. you encouraged my application. And I said, I did in order to print to really get it going. And so I did the residency at Yado and light work. And I was just last March was on another residency at Virginia. And the pandemic happened. And I, I was very fortunate that Plant Art had. had Given me the opportunity to have an exhibit when I told about the book we're do, doing. And I wanted to, was going to do it at Silver Gelatin Prints, and all the labs were closed. So that became my pandemic project. I made a, a, a dark room in my basement and pushed my <laughs> dark room in my basement in Woodstock. And these, all these prints were made in, there. And I am tickled. I just love, I was scared to do it. I was like, would I really enjoy doing it again? Like if we went through all this, it's like, I'm losing myself there. I love it. And I printed all the color as well, but the, the, the black and white was the first time I ever printed this large and, and int intensely. And to me, there's a difference. That's yeah. what's so exciting. For the first time these negatives are being printed. Right? They've never been necessarily printed before. No, no, no. And you printed them, that's another thing. Yes, yes, and the, the, the disco work was really not seen until we got the idea of doing the book, Tale of Two Cities, Disco of Bushwick, and because I had this epiphany that the work belonged together, and and I'd never shown them. I wasn't, you know, just, I didn't know they were special. Mm -hmm. Did not know. And, and how about these, the color slides? How do you print that? Okay, well? the color slides, they were... And when I had my first initial show of them in 2011, when I started showing them. Now, actually, first in 2007 at Brooklyn Historical Society, I scanned them and gave them to the lab at FIT to print. And you know what? My daddy was a printer, not a photography printer, but a printer. I have also printed my own work, you know, black and white beforehand. And you also have a set of how you see the world. And even they, though the prints looked fine to everyone else on the well known plane, they weren't how I saw. Mm -hmm. So I began this process starting in 2007 to say, well, I have to learn how to scan them better myself and how to print them how I want them to look. And so that began the process of, of getting them how, how I see reality. We have, all have our ways of seeing. And so this is, to me, that this is what the color looked like. This is what the scene looks like. So it's mm -hmm. my, it's my, int my interpretation. Well, that's right. So many decisions are occurring at the printing stage as well, not just the, the taking the photo stage, mm -hmm. right? Well, yes, it's, a, it's the realization, just mm -hmm. like you write. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of thoughts that you're seeing that that's how you put it together and edit and re-edit and edit. Mm -hmm. and it mm -hmm. becomes your vision or your process. And so these existed, you had roles of, Film in a closet somewhere. Yeah. Tubs and yeah, no, I, they were in tubs, no, but the, it's fortunately I did. Someone must have given me a lesson. Actually, I was, I was talking to Ken Hyman, who 
show me that you just put some negatives in, in loosely books and put some in order. Mm. And so thank goodness you did that. So I put Delta Feld film, put them in loose sleeves, write the, the date and like where it was and any major people in it or it was like, I also realized it was like a, a diary. I write personal things about it, like why I was upset. Like and lesson just, plans. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I put away, so I could, I was able to find that and they were in, mostly in chronological order. And these, my boxes and boxes and boxes of slides, I, I, you know, I put it you know, the month today and the major subject. When I moved, we talked about moving, why did I ever take them out of the slide drawers and put them in boxes? It, you know, it's never, you never put it back to just as well. So I have not gone through all, I'm starting back. I've never stopped photographing. I'm starting from the beginning. It's mm -hmm. like doing your memoir. Mm -hmm. You got to start from the beginning. And so I'm working my way up through the 70s and 80s and just the boxes that said Bushwick, or IS-291 in the early 90s. The rest is a mystery. <laughs> I just, I, I like the idea. I never wanted to look back. You know, I always wanted to keep going. And so I didn't actually keep things as well organized as you. No, 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 <laughs> I'm getting no, 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 all no, no. my stuff, my <laughs> archives, because I saved everything. But I, I, I don't, it's, I, I like to look back, but it brings back a lot of memories. It's an old book I'm never gonna write, but I also want to keep doing. So I love, but at the same time that you're looking at your older work, you're continuing on. That's great. It's and challenging. It's, it's challenging because it's, as we know, we've talked about a lot of things, the two of us, and, and about focusing and how hard it is to pay attention to something. And it, it takes a lot of like putting on the blinders to, to to finish a, a book project or exhibit. Anyone who's done it. Don't bother me, Patty, I'm busy. And the past can bring up memories, not always good yeah. memories. Oh, oh it's it's just tears. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, I have and, emotion. And, uh, and we have some people who have been the subjects of these photos and they bring to back in the fact. Actually, the, the greatest joy, like even in, in this exhibit, the opening is a photograph of, of a family having a picnic in the while fixing their car, and three of the family members showed up here. And that's great. And I'd never met them before. They sold on Instagram, and and I knew it was them. And it, it, you could tell by their faces, and they were thrilled, and they were happy, and they were saying, you know, these are our uncles, and they passed away, and wow. I tried to tell my nieces what they were like, and you, the greatest compliment you captured their authenticity. Mm -hmm. And that made me feel really, really good. And then another young man who I haven't seen since he's in eighth grade and now is a, you know, now he's, 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 how can he be in his forties? And he came and he was photographing and he's a photographer who happens to be a barber, but he photographs in his barber shop. And then he said, oh, I'm going around to all your other spots where you're going. And so that's really, that's, so much fun when people find themselves and contact me. And one of the essayists in here is the subject of one of your photos. Yes, Vanessa Martyr. In 2011, I had this show at Soho Photo Gallery. And at the time, I wanted this work to be seen by Bushwick community. And I reached when I was having to show at Soho Photo. I made sure I said, like, oh, look, there's a, a blog in Bushwick. Reach out to him, Bushwick Daily. They came. Bushwick Community Dark Room, they came. And people came from Bushwick. And a, a, a young reporter in, who was in graduate school time for journalism showed up, did, did a piece. And then she called me up and said, you know, I'm in the middle of my finals. I, I just can't get this out. And Tom wanted to this going. I said, don't worry, you're talking to a teacher. Your, your class comes first. But she did put it out. And it was on, on the web. And she, this young woman, Vanessa Martier, who was a writer, was doing teaching workshops at, at Bushwick High School. She was like you, uncertified teacher giving workshops. And, so, and, and the kids were kind of bitching about what the neighborhood was like. And she said, oh, you have no idea what it's like. I mean, I grew up here, this, this, this is like so changed. Like I taught at ICE, I go like, oh, this is a piece of cake. I'm staying here till retirement. And, and the teacher in charge said, Look, you, know, you should look up the work of well, Meryl Meisner, which to me shocks me that she would know my name. And on her break, Vanessa 
in the non computer, looked up, found this reel, this video piece playing, and she goes, and there's her family in the picture. And she contacts me. I get an email and my spam request saying, um, 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 in your, your fam my family is in your photograph and I'm floored. And I open the, the spam request, I read it, and it's basically saying that she's been working on her memoir of growing up in Bushwick. And she came to a, a very difficult chapter, a chapter writing about a, a man in the building who molested her as a child, you know, continuously. And isn't he the person looking straight at the camera? And the, the, I was so shocked. My knee jerk reaction, anyone who's a teacher in the room, what I did, I deleted the email because I was so, I was in shock. And, so, and I deleted it. And then I like was able to find a spam request so I can get her name. And then I Googled to make sure she was over 18 and not in prison or wanted. And we contacted each other and decided to collaborate. So that was a very intensive collaboration Gosh, for two years. I had no idea. Yeah, my yeah. Goodness. So she wrote an essay. Yeah. One of my other collaborators, besides, is uh, in the back of the book and many throughout, is Judy Jupiter, and she's right here in the audience, my disco buddy. Hearing from her the, the last Thursday of the month, she'll be having a solo. It's pretty thinking about her work. So it's really a, it's Wait, a, with Grace Jones. A grace, you know, we was grace her. She is grace her. Yeah, there you go. Look better. Yes. No, I'm just saying the photo had. Yes, it just it's, happens it's, to be. It's iconic for so many yeah, reasons. Uh, well, right next to Grace like Jones like and yeah. some other people, and there's Cheryl, and she's appears a lot, and Thank my life God. partner, Joe Bryan, is a designer of all, all the books, and we we are now Parallel Pictures Press. Yeah. Uh, well, I have to say also working with you on this photo project in Bushwick, I can see how people come alive for your photos because it's through your personality. Thank you. They come alive because of you. you glow, you're glowing, they're glowing. I think it's reflected in the photos. It makes no Thank difference. You. Thank you very much. You know, every, every, everyone here can take a camera and photograph this the same microphone and it would all come out differently. We really have unique ways of seeing. Which is amazing unto itself. Just, you're formidable, but not threatening. I'm formidable, but not threatening? Yes, and I think oh, that's why it works. Yes. Okay. You, when you, you, why people respond to you. Oh, thank you. Well, and you take one photo, and it's it. That's it. It's usually the best. It's, that's it. Let's do it. <laughs> well, I was also trained, trained, trained in film and, right. and low budget, so you don't overdo it. Right. And like today, where I went to snap, 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 yes, and exactly. nothing looks good. Okay. Right. So I, 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 I do snap, snap, step sometimes and before, but almost always it's the first one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And another, see, another, my method is not everyone's, I, I usually ask everyone, the people permission. So they say no, okay, okay, so they say no. Mm -hmm. So it's like, in the world, just like, you know, and I usually tell them why. Like, mm -hmm. you have the coolest outfit on, or I love your hair, or something about it. And just, and just You're not coming up with, as a paparazzi trying to catch them at some moment. No, I'm not a paparazzi. I've never had that never have been and I didn't have the pressure of working under contract because there was mm -hmm. none so mm -hmm. it was free reign. And never a joke either. Mm -hmm. you know, it's never a joke. I mean you, the way people it's not like oh everyone's in on the joke and this is the person in the picture. No 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 it's, yeah. it's you're in on their life. Yes, yes. yes. It, 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 just, it, it was my life as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It's, it's, that's, it's, that's it's right. It's great life together. Yes, in exactly. the and for the color work, were, what was your intention in creating those slides? Were you eventually going to print them? Were you just keeping well, a record of your teaching? Well, when, I, when I first started, good question. Since most of the time I carried a camera with me, and I don't actually try to slow down thinking, what am I if I'm not a camera? But when I accepted the job in Bushwick, it did have a, a reputation in the neighborhood. And as the previous June in school, at the Lower East Side, I had been robbed of my camera. Uh, a man in a suit and tie came in during the end of year party, looked at me and said, give me your camera, I have a gun. I gave him my camera. No one else saw him, but I didn't ask, don't tell me, he took my camera. And so I was, a little scared to do it again. And this was definitely 
let's put it this way. In the fall of, of 81, I was teaching in East New York. East New York looked great next to Bushwick. It just, it, it, Bushwick seemed much nicer. And so I didn't carry a camera and then I couldn't resist anymore. So by February, I think for a Holly gift, I, I, Patty bought me a point and shoot camera. And I brought that with color slide film because I no longer, I did not have time to develop film and be up in the dark room, but just being at work every day and coming again and being conscious and in control at eight o'clock in the morning was enough. And so I carried, put in color slide film and have it develop. It was, I was seeing, I couldn't resist because I was actually started seeing the beauty. Mm -hmm. I started seeing the kids playing and the parents having, being parents and guardians and the, and the beauty of life. And if I saw a building, you know, it was like, geez, a history there, or a nice light. I look, remember looking at a field and like, it's just like, everything's rubble and there's a big tree fall and, fall and I'm thinking, Angela Adams would take this picture. So I signed that in school to take the picture yeah. because I knew he would. And I saw, I, you know, not, I'm educated. I was totally aware of Helen Levitt and I was, you know, the kids playing on the street, mommy and my kids are playing on the street. It, and this is in retrospect. I, and for me, I realized photography is a memoir. And, and the photographs, especially the Bushwick were positive reinforcement. The reason to get up every day and come back again, because I, I was in teaching for the money <laughs> and the healthcare and the benefits. This is how she I was a fabulous teacher. She was a Thank you. super teacher. Thank you very much. And, and I needed to have a reason to come back besides needing to do that. And so I look for positive things because, and I know that only because I was looking through my things like, do you have no photographs of heroin needles, crack files? I made one alcohol bottle. I didn't photograph people who were strung out, who were not conscious. I was, purposely doing it. So I think it for me, it was lifting me up. I didn't even photograph the graffiti murals, very few, because so many of them were two young people who were killed too young and I would not even know who they were. Okay. It, it, right. Heartbreaking. You weren't looking to be a voyeur or document ruin porn is what you hear. Yeah, or, or maybe things that would make me just cry. Mm -hmm. So I, I was photographing things I found personally mm -hmm. uplifting. Mm -hmm. And at first, one time in 1984, through a photography group, I, my girls got the special movie photographers. I had the opportunity to have a show at, at a lab, and it was called School of Surroundings. And at that point, I took some of the photographs I've taken from three years of different schools and made Stephen Crumbs. At that point, it was $100 a pop. I mean, when you're making $10,000 $10, a year, that was like, I could never afford to do this again. So then I, that, that was it. I, mm. And so I started painting on those. I can't, that was way beyond anything mm. I could ever afford. But something like, it's your, when something's your passion, you do it. If you sing and you don't, you don't have a recording contract, you sing anyway, right? You, know, you sing in the shower, you go to a piano, or whatever it is you sing. Whether or not you can carry it to you sing because you love it. This is how to talk for you to be something I love doing. Like you might love cooking. You may not be a professional chef, but you pour yourself in, or you might like the eating. You may not be a food critic, but you can still love eating. You, you do it with a gusto because it's your passion. And I want to ask about the pairing. I find the pairing of the two series so interesting. You do it, you've done it in multiple books now, yeah, yeah. where you, it's the disco and the Bushwick together, okay. often in the recto and the verso of the pages. And you're thinking about the the, uh, the formal characteristics, I think, very often. How does this photo talk to the other photo? That kind of thing. Uh, what do you look for in these pairings? Why do you do it this way? Why don't have, okay, this is the disco era, this is the Bushwick era? Well, so this is my third. I had an epiphany in 2011. I went to a drag burlesque bar in Bushwick called Bazaar. I was invited to be there by the owner who like my work and he literally had a, a space in his basement he had opened this building and he said he wants to show work like mine down there i'd gone up during bush and studios and i said 
oh yeah, space like, and he had photographs on the wall of his own. His name is John Stefan Sauver. He's a filmmaker who from Paris who moved to Bushwick and saw this club. And he was like, and I don't gallery and I want to show work like yours. And, and he had photographs on the wall of, of, from his film still, stills. I said, oh, great, how's it going? Showing your work. He said, well, it's okay. He said, you know, it is a bar. People get drunk. They take the work off the wall, you know, ruin it or take it away. And I go upstairs and I'm having lunch, taking a break with Vanessa. And I said, well, this is great. You're interesting. Here I am. I've had work in museums and real galleries. And now a, a drag burlesque bar in Bushwick that has a basement a gallery where people take the stuff up the wall, wants to give me a show. And I'm laughing and she looked at me and she said, don't see me such a snob. <laughs> and I was, thought about that, so I, okay. So, and I can go back a few weeks later, he's having an event. I, I go there and the place is popping. It's nighttime, everyone's dancing, having a ball. There's a disco ball overhead. I go into the ladies room and it's all mirrored and it's a, another little disco ball, I'm doing my lipstick and I had like a oh, eureka moment. I had a, oh, an epiphany. I realized that my roles had, had yeah. intertwined, come together. That back in 1977, when Judy Drupin and I were supposed to go to a private party at Studio 54, when we go to go out, there's no lights. There's no subway, there's no buses. We take the bicycle, Studio 54 is closed. It's like, what? The next day, I, the, what it seemed like the world heard of some place called Bushwick where there was looting and fires and just sound, sound like a hellhole neighborhood. And like, I never dreamed that I would ever be part of my life. And, and also at that time, all the snobbia clubs would not allow people in from, the bridge and if you look like you from the bridge and tunnel crowd, like, no, did you go out to clubs? You were a child, you were an infant. You couldn't even get a fake ID. I was better looking than Okay, yes, yes, yes. Oh, you're very cute. <laughs> and so it was not considered cool to be. But I like, I like, I did go to Studio 54, but I like basement bars a lot too, okay. just so you know. Okay, <laughs> I'm like, get around guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> So, <clears throat> so it hit me that there's a disco ball head, the disco ball out there. It's a, it's a wild mixed, you know, LGBTQ, everyone mixed crowd, and, and, and they even be a lesbian teaching in, in Bushwick. Then you wouldn't, even, you, just, you just don't talk about it. It was like the thought that it would become a, a neighborhood that became a, a large. Uh, non-gender conforming community was really shocking to me but it hit me that this world's intertwined and and this bar would be the best place to show that so in the middle of party, I, I went out and i i said john you know how's how's it going with the basement bar down there showing your work you know with people stealing work he goes oh we figured it out we bolt the work work to the wall i was like uh huh. Okay. Are you still interested in showing my work for uh, Bushwick Open Studios? He said, "Yes, it's history." I came back a few weeks later, saying, "Thinking, you know, well, you know, it was there with hundreds of people dancing, and it was rip roaring. You want to make sure you understood what I said." He said, "Absolutely, it's history." Now, was in my mind, I had decided I would have showed the both work. I never told him. In February, it was February of of 2014, which would go to studios is in June. I had already put in some proposals to some publishers to, to about doing a book of my Bushwick 80s photos that had always been it. And in the middle of, you know, there's a big snowstorm happening and he wants me in there. It's like oh, feet of snow. And he sits me down and he says, I'm gonna do a book. I said, you mean book, you made a catalog. No, a book. He takes a I think he's out of his mind. And, but, you know, I'll, I'll humor him and it, and, you know, it just takes as much work to put a, put a show together. I, I said, but John, I don't want to just show my Bushwick work. I want to show it with my disco work. It's a long story, but this work goes together. And he's like, disco, really? I'm like, what? 
I said, yes. So, well, can I see some? I said, well, I have to find it. And I'll scan it because I've never shown it to anybody. And he was working on a, went to work on a film project in South America and worked like a man where we just making scanning samples. I knew, to familiar with a lot of my bullshit work. So I would take my negative pages and pick it up and go, oh, match, oh. It was an instant match game. And I just had to go on gut instinct, make a scan of it, put the placements together, I'm emailing it to him, and then I show him a few, and he goes, I got it. He understood. And so it was an exchange where he's working on this film project, and I'm sending samples, and he says, well, what about this one, this one? Patricia O'Brien here was a, working as a, a um, design manager, manager in broadcast news. Oh, well, okay, come on, you can sign a book. You can design for television, sign a book. And we, we just did it. It came out miraculously in June without a distributor, just launching it in this bizarre basement in Bushwick. And uh, I'll just show you the proof. First book. So it's Bushwick compared to disco. Yeah. And it's it sold out. It was a sensation. Yeah. And the price I see now is three hundred fifty dollars. That's a deal. People are selling it for five hundred dollars and up on on We better bolt this up. one down. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a bargain. So the ones that if you those who have it, yes, people before there was five of them on sale for five hundred and up, but now it's only two. So either they took it off the market or Whatever, so it's a bargain, it can't for so three fifty. <laughs> and from that book, John Stefan said, well, let's do another one. Mm -hmm. yeah, next year, it's like, well, okay, I know exactly what I want to do. I want to talk about the earlier work, and before that, because many Maybe people, just try. there's many people, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and, the back, and I wanted to talk about where I come from, because many people commented, like you did, that people are smiling. And besides that, there's seemingly wreckage. There's like a lot of joy in the pictures and, and humor. And so I wanted to talk about my background. And I come from a heritage of humor and also uh, some a, a moment of, of anti Semitism as well. And so in this book, I compare juxtapose Long Island and moving to the city. Well, you know, Long Island and the city of London. And this happened in 2000, this book was 2015. Three stars, that one, three stars. And again, yeah. it's signed it, Bizarre Publishing. There was some personal circumstance in our life, in my family life, where they were very hard. And there's been a break. But one of the lovely things when you sent me into this rabbit hole of back into my analog roots. Mm -hmm. Because to me, this is a diamond. Black and white prints coming out of the computer are fine stones. I don't, there's no comparison, yes. in my opinion. Yeah. And Let's that's pretty much all we see now. When we see photos, these huge photos in the art, yeah, most art galleries, they're laser printouts, right? Yeah, 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 something, or, or, or some, um, something like that. Black, but, yeah. I mean, I, it, I want to do it. I mm -hmm. feel so. And there was, I was literally working on another idea for a book, but realized this so, because of working on the two other shows, museum shows that had to go through my nightlife, I kept on seeing more images mm -hmm. that were like, well, look at this one, look at this one, look at this one. Uh, and then, and, and even for the first book, some of the best books are, was for photographs. I thought they, I thought it was a joke in mm -hmm. some ways. Like I'm just going along with it's never going to happen. I held back some of the strongest photographs because I had this proposal in for a real publisher. Mm -hmm. So this your, one is your, huh? your mother appears occasionally. Can My mother appears it many often, and she is yes, she 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 that hair. I love those photos. I love. I do too. Yeah. My yeah. mom is in Harper's Bazaar this month. She is spelling. Her mother's in a lot of it. Of the books like, that right, right, pictures of her mother getting her hair teased yeah. or with playing yeah. cards yeah. with her friends, teased like, yeah. like yeah. teased. Yeah, yeah. She's it's amazing. She's so you were there to document your mother. You were there to document your mother preparing herself to go, to go out. out. You were there. there. Yes, you were mother. there. She let you take pictures. Yeah, yes, I, I, I am. 
But you actually got a grant to do that, right? To go back to Long Island, or is that oh, no, that's okay. well, in, in, Thank you. In 1978, I received a, it's the only time I made a full-time living as a photographer. I was a CETA photographer, Company Owners of Employment Training Act. It's like the WPA of the 70s. And I used my Long Island photographs to do what, to, to interview for different agencies. One of the people who interviewed me is an artist represented by this gallery, Maria Patty Allen, so we first met. And she, she must have helped pass my application to the next point. So I did get hired by the American Jewish Congress to do, to document, but create an archive of Jewish New York. And my personal project was my, sorry, we're, we're locked in, our, don't tell Dara, we're, we're locked together. <laughs> and to document Jewish New York and research my own family roots. And as part of my community service, I chose to do teaching because even though my undergraduate degree was in art education, when I graduated first in my class, I was terrified of teaching, mm -hmm. the idea of it. So I wanted to get experience. And I also come from a very, you know, working family. Like my dad said, this is very nice, you have a grant, but when are you getting a real job? Uh -huh. So, you know, and so I use my teaching experience as CETA to do that. And we're at a point of our history as a city, as a nation, that there's going to be, you know, going through tough times economic, and there are going to be grant, grant opportunities are opening up for art, visual and performing artists. To, so for to your younger people, the CETA program service. was the federal money where cities hired people or different hired people. Almost, they, they got paid more than interns, but it was more or less internships, and many of them then got jobs at that agency or at the, at the you know, gallery or wherever it was that they were doing. It was a, you know, a ladder to getting an actual job, but it was a wonderful program. And yes. Everybody's retired. Who is it and, and, uh, and it's underknown. People talking about the two. So I'm, I always talk about it in all my shows because I think it's so important to me as a person, as an artist. And so other people, we found, you know, we like found each other. We're like the city, city people, and, and we've been meeting to try to get its history known. And and city law received a grant from the National Endowment of Humanities to do a traveling show next, starting next year. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a you know WPA was wonderful, but this is we're still alive. You know, like we're still here. We can we can let you know. You know this is a work a, a more recent model. And so, and so also a history, like it was all around the country, but for the same photographers, we, we recorded in New York City. Senator, I want to ask you, yes, you've been um, open about your HIV positive diagnosis. And I, I'm wondering who we are exiting what I think is the end of a pandemic. It was not New York's first pandemic. We've had yellow fever of the 1790s, cholera, typhus, influenza, and AIDS. Do you see parallels between the experience of AIDS and that of COVID? Very much so, especially in the beginning, because in the beginning of the HIV AIDS, it wasn't even called that. Yes. It's called GRID, you know, gay something, something, something mm -hmm. bad. Um, and uh, no one knew how it was transmitted. And uh, uh, so sort of you have to make up your own rules of how to beware of not catching something. And it was very similar to what we went through in New York. Um, I just, I have to say that I, it's, I'm very sad about people passed away and it's terrible what happened and, and the small businesses that went under. But I also, there was a part of me that liked the people who left, it was, Fine. I like the people who were left here and I could ride my bicycle down Fifth Avenue without uh, the traffic. And there's just a, a certain camaraderie, you know, in our, where we live, people, we stepped out here, we'll go shopping for seniors. And it was just a, uh, there was just something about uh, um, the camaraderie. And to a certain extent that happened with the HIV AIDS crisis. I mean, the HGMHC and the buddy system. And so, and by the way, one of the reasons they were able to come up with a vaccine was because of the hard work of AIDS activists, in particular the Treatment Action Group um, that's been working on 
uh, HIV and hepatitis and uh, tuberculosis and all of the, the communicable diseases, because these are really diseases of poverty now. And, uh, but all of that research is what led to the rapid development of uh, the vaccine. Like I said before, I'm a, I'm a Pfizer baby. You know, I think, you know, I'll mix if you, Moderna's and Pfizer's can hang out with the Johnson and Johnson's. But anyway, but it is interesting that now, how many years since the age of 40 years or something? No vaccine, no vaccine. But it did lead to uh, a vaccine um, um, that's saving lives. Mm -hmm. It did seem like New York got smaller again for a period of time. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I do, right? <laughs> Yes. Yeah, um, I think this would be a great time to open up for questions. Thank you. Mr. Director, something that's really important since this is June Pride Month, Senator Tom Duane was, a, besides being the first openly gay senator, say senator, was introduced the first to introduce legislation for equality and, and, and marriage, same sex marriage. You yeah. fought yeah. 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 You can't tell anymore. This gay street, like someone with wedding ring, they were heterosexual. Now you don't know. Like you hit on someone, you see, you don't know. It's a very difficult world now with the, with the marriage. And the I know guy in their 30s, and they're like, I'm divorced. And on the one hand, I'm like, oh, you know, that's how I said you're divorced. And they're like, yes, we're just like everybody else, married and divorced in their 30s. You know what I mean? It's a whole new world. I mean, I don't wish that on them, but it, you know, it's striking in a way. If you, want to, if, you, if you want to get married and divorced, you can. That's important. <laughs> you're in your wedding, right? Yes. <laughs> any, uh, any questions, comments? Yes. Uh, I heard somebody saying, or was it Meryl, that the, uh, the nightlife photo is it just as a medium format, or was it like, I was just interested, you know, like sometimes you like go with the camera, so is it too big, is it intrusive, like was it a medium, or like what did you just go? So, to be to be open on hearing up here, but you're so, yes. The question is uh, about the particular medium format camera. You want to know the type of camera you yeah. use. Oh, what you shot the pistol photo with? Right. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you asked. Here it comes. Ah, uh, that no one's uh, talking about this, and no one. I'm not in love with it. Yeah, this is, this is like the same one, the same the first, the one that was stolen was stolen. But I did get a replica, and at first I really I feel like it was like a, it wasn't the real thing. So you know, it was like this one had been with me everywhere. But uh, you know, I'm looking at Yeah, this same girl. Camera and, and this was broken for years. In, we're, we're super highway information highway. We're together. Where did um, I get it? Worldwide internet. Where did I get it? Where did I get the replica? Yeah. Well, the first one I got an older camera. Oh. An older camera. Is it a six seven format? Uh, it's a two and a quarter. But square. Yeah, square. Oh, okay. I love it. That has a split image, and it, it works. And it's like sees how I see. You know. So, this is how I see. Well, this, this is so comfortable and I'm so happy with it again. I did have a six by seven. It's too heavy. This is lighter. I, I love it. Yes. So I'm um, that, and, but it was broken for many years. It, would, it was arthritic. It wouldn't work in cold weather and no one would fix it. And I thought that was it. And I went, went to, Searching for someone, and at B and H, they gave me the cord of somebody. It was down the block here, up this block, and this little mom and pop's camera repair. They fix it. They moved during the pandemic. They moved to Florida. Is it? Oh, I we know you. Just ship it down if we have. Mm -hmm. and by one and two, they hit on eBay as well. Seema, the woman at that small shop that used to uh, for Miami. Yeah, the same person that spoke to her. Yeah, he spoke to her. Uh, he spoke to them yesterday. Oh, we just went to Miami. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Y
know exactly panoramic camera. Yes. Yes. Is it yes. is it difficult to make, even maintain, find supplies, film for this kind of equipment? Film, no, you can still get. Yeah. Film. Are people rediscovering medium format? Do you think? I believe. Well, what do you think? You're obviously. No, I think so. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I mean, I think there's a, yeah. a resurgence. There's a resurgence in interest in analog. Yeah. It, <laughs> you know, what am I? And, and, not, and if there isn't. <laughs> I was just saying, one of my many jobs, because I, you know, I would work during the day and do my activism at night, I worked at ad agencies and specifically in print production. And we used to have to coordinate sending plates from, uh, you know, Hearst to Condé Nast, and you would send proofs and progs, which were colored, you know, the, the main separations. Part, separations yes. yes. And you had to ship them out. And they would show you a sample of what it was going to look like in the in the magazine and the print. Which was a whole department where they put eat words in, you know, with a as exacto knife. That's how. Yes. And what what happens now? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. all digital. It's bang. It's done. But you know that. No, because you? my daddy was a printer. Right, that's right. Right. I ran on Twenty Fifth Street. I mean, this was the, there was a lot of printing around here, oh. and also in Hudson Square was a huge printing area and. Uh, uh, there's a sewing machine block. Uh, yeah. There's the flower market. There's the where they make the mannequins, which is on 25th Street. All of these Chelsea blocks have, you know, the, they were display uh, equipment, and they all still exist. They still exist. Don't yeah. you see it's that? That's like, yeah. something. I, I think I see those things. Like, like you're trained to see it, so you notice it, and you know the smell of the printer's ink, and you know. Yes, yeah, so, and there was a big union, and of course, all the newspapers were, you know done the same way it was you know exacto nice and yeah. they put it down on the paper and see what it looked like and it wasn't that long ago but it's mm -hmm. been, we've had a radical shift in in, in technology yes it's hard to have a job as a linotypist these days <laughs> yes. Yes. yes 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 the and typesetter the yeah. polaroids have come back yes that's polaroids yes, yes. you don't take you didn't take polaroids and then take the actual photo you just went right yeah. in yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, oh yes, please. Thank thank you. You. Last question. Yes. Uh, I feel like your work has a quality, she has a quality that you said with her work. Although some of her work, like the little paparazzi, but I feel that the quality that your work and her work have in common are both a very, very close intimacy with the subject and at the same time a distance. Did you do saying Arbus? Is that who you talked about? No, he's at, he's at, he's at, yeah, uh, but obviously I was inspired by oh, her yeah, um, and, and felt like very close and far away at the same time. Yeah, I, I see that as well. Like the connection, but also a distance and a critical distance, but also a connection to the human. And the snapshot of aesthetic. I'm sure. Well, it, it educated snapshots. Mm -hmm. She, as a teacher, she was very, uh, she, she was very, if she chose you to be in her class, she was very positive. And she didn't talk about technique, she talked about image. You know, she talked about the soul of it, the heart of it, the reading of it. I said, this photo of the child with the two police officers is so current, even though it's not current. It's it's just a no. I'm sorry, we are all. Anyone else looks says, "Oh, remember those uniforms?" Like, don't they still wear those uniforms? Yeah. I don't think they're quite the same. <laughs> no, but it's it's uh, amazing yeah. that photo. It's one of your mm -hmm. yeah. and any subject in any of these would be so thrilled that they appeared in one of your photos. Yeah. Well, I love hearing that. They've discovered them through um, the magic of the internet. They've come around and found. Them. I love it. Yeah, you know, like I, you know, I, I, and that they're happy with it. Yes, that's even the best. I hope you find find more. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks online for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. in real life events as well. So. Thank you. <laughs> Once I uh, I stop. Oh, it's happening. It's happening. There's something, there's something odd or something, isn't there like a no, program? Odd. But.